Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In today's episode, we will talk about the Shramik special trains and the problems that the passengers have been facing on them. We will also talk about the drug hydroxychloroquine and what the latest research says about it. But first, we talk about locusts. Over the past few days, swarms of locusts, lakhs and lakhs of them, have been sighted in many parts of urban India. In Madhya Pradesh, in Maharashtra's Vidarbha region, and more visibly in Rajasthan. In videos online, one can see them cover entire trees, fields, roads, and even skies. This is unusual. India does see locusts annually, but not in swarms, and not in these parts. So what happened this time? Where have these locusts suddenly appeared from? And how come they have decided to give cities a visit this time? Before we answer these questions, let's first talk about locusts themselves. What exactly are they? Locusts are actually grasshoppers who have come together for go- doing nothing good. That's Partha Sati Biswas. He reports on agriculture for the Indian Express and has been reporting on the locust problem. And he explains that locusts as creatures are very different when they are alone and completely different when they come together as a group. So if they're in the solitary or in the grasshopper stage, they're pretty innocuous. They live alone, eat relatively little and do very little damage. However, there are certain conditions when they start coming together and there they undergo something called a behavioral change. To put it in a nutshell, if a lot of them come together, they get into mischief. They enter into what is called a gregarious state. In this state where they are socializing, they change color, grow bigger muscles and start migrating huge distances. Eating away every little bit of greenery, they can set their eyes or sense upon. So they are polyphagous in nature. They eat anything and everything. These locusts actually originate from the Horn of Africa, from countries like Ethiopia and Somalia. In the Horn of Africa, they originate, then they travel around the Arabian Peninsula, and a couple of them cross Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and come to the Indo-Pakistan border. That's how far they can travel. In the Indo-Pakistan border, mostly they are in the Baluchistan and other areas, while in India, they come to Punjab, Gujarat, and some portions of Punjab, some portions of Rajasthan. Mostly locusts are reported in the month in between the months of July and October. That, that is their 90-day life cycle. When they mate, they lay eggs, they breed, and then they again fly back. But this time they have arrived early and in much bigger numbers. And this is because of something that happened in 2018. In the year 2018, there were two back-to-back cyclones in the Arabian Peninsula. The, one of the cyclones was Mekunu and another was Luban. It had stuck Oman and Yemen in 2018. These cyclones were accompanied by heavy rains, which turned large inhabited desert tracks into lakes. And these lakes had become the hotspot for locust breeding. Species like the desert locusts, which are storming India right now, only lay eggs in moist soil. And rains in the middle of the desert provided them with the right opportunity. And so they multiplied in huge numbers. To give you an estimation of the number of locusts that a single square kilometer can have, FAO, that is the Food Agriculture Organization of the United Nations says that around per square kilometer would have around 40 to 80 million locusts. So imagine each locust, they can lay around 80 legs three times in their life cycle. Imagine the amount of time they can multiply. In a swarm, the swarm can multiply almost 200 times in a single go. And if this happens thrice in their life cycle, then you can imagine 200 into 3, that is 600 times. A swarm can become that huge a number. The size of swarms can get up to 1,200 kilometers square or more. That's twice the size of Mumbai. So when they fly out, like we saw the visuals from Jaipur, when they fly out the sky, actually, they can actually dim out the sun. And when they sit on trees, when they sit on buildings, you cannot see a single inch without a locust. They're pretty big creatures. So in 2018, when they started breeding in the middle of the desert in Yemen, no one took notice. Parthasarthi says that this is because, one, those areas practically don't see any human beings. And two, because Yemen has been going through a major civil strife. And that's why the control mechanism was not triggered. 
those swarms they bred for multiple generation then they started migrating towards pakistan in 2018 the rabi season in gujarat and in most of large extents in rajasthan and to some extent in gujarat farmers started noticing locusts and a large number of locusts towards the rabi season that is from december to january the lwo that is the locust warning organization the, that is a, a wing which is special which has under the union ministry of agriculture which is specialized into monitoring controlling and studying the movement of locusts had carried out operations cleaning operations over 4 lakh hectares area in rajasthan gujarat and some portions in punjab that was the rabi of 2019-20 these present swarms of locusts were first sighted in april this year in areas along the india pakistan border in rajasthan the lwo had immediately started taking action and that's when they realized that something was different this time now locust coming in april is not that big of a problem for indian agriculture because by this time all the crops have been harvested and there is not much greenery on the field but because of this the locusts have taken a different route so these locusts they are also hungry creatures they also want to survive and aided with the strong winds they started moving towards urban areas wherever there is green cover they started eating the green cover the green canopy of the cities and aided with the strong wind they have been moving to urban areas so last 2 3 days we have seen a lot of locust in jaipur then there were sightings in madhya pradesh a swarm has come in to madhya pradesh and some of them have come into maharashtra vidarbha area of maharashtra especially amravati nagpur and vardha district because they couldn't find anything in agricultural fields they're now devouring all the greenery they can find in cities they are feeding on the green foliage they are eating near they are feeding on every green tree they can find and at night they are resting on the tall structures may it may be tree it may be a mobile tower or anything they can find and so apart from perhaps the orange growers in maharashtra partha sarthi says that farmers in india aren't that worried but not worrying he says in itself is worrisome once the monsoon starts the monsoon officially is just a week or so ahead of us once the monsoon starts this locust will start breeding and they will start laying eggs once the eggs are laid young locust will emerge and they will start eating away of till their fourth till they attain adulthood that phase is going to coincide with the growth phase of every kharif crop that we take for example that could mean threat to cotton in maharashtra soya bean in rajasthan groundnut in gujarat and pulses like moong and orat in madhya pradesh if they move more with the wind there is a very clear danger they can come to the south of the country they can get into other parts of the country also there are some reports which say that there might be sightings in the national capital but that is not verified we have we don't really know how this is going to move all that we know now is they are moving with the wind whichever is the wind direction they are moving they are light creatures and they can cover great distances in a single day conservative estimates say that in a single day they can cover 150 kilometers but if wind conditions are favorable they can even travel 400 kilometers or more already sowing of cotton has happened in punjab and from what we hear the cotton area in punjab has grown compared to last year so the saplings must be at their growth phase if the locust reaches there it will be complete devastation for the farmers but touch wood they have not done, they have not reached those areas as of now There have been a number of reports of farmers trying to get rid of the locusts by banging utensils and blaring loud music. In order to scare away the locusts, the farmers they create a lot of din by beating up utensils, and in some cases they even light up some fire, temporary fire, to kill the locusts or to shoo them away. But these are applicable if the size of the swarm is small. But if you have a swarm strong enough to dim out the sun, then I don't think you know, whatever kind of noise you make will have any effect on them. So how do you get rid of locusts? The only way we can control locusts is to spray organophosphate pesticides like malatonin on the, the night shelters of the locusts. LWO has been using mounted spray guns filled with these pesticides and have imported some 60 more from the UK. They have also allowed drones to be operational to spray the insecticide insecticides on locust breeding points and resting points. We have to act fast because this is not something that we can take lightly. As I told you, this locust causes great devastation. As of now, if you look at uh, FAO, if you look at the FAO's prediction, countries like uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia are now at the cusp of a great threat to their food security. Multiple swarms of locusts were active there, and they have eaten away almost everything that was grown. Crops like maize, wheat, and sorghum there have been almost completely wiped out. 
According to some estimates, even a small swarm can eat enough food for 35,000 people daily. So these countries are facing the question about their food security. And India being a primarily agricultural country, the same thing can happen if you let this. Pakistan has been facing this problem too. Earlier this year, the Pakistani government declared a national emergency after locusts attacked winter crops. According to UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, the country will likely face nearly $2 billion losses in these winter crops alone. It could also see similar damage for its summer crops as well. Parthasarthi says that one reason Pakistan could not combat the attack well was because of the ongoing COVID crisis. But India that way has taken action on time. But the magnitude of the problem is big. In initial days, there were some reports about some problems regarding movement of the melatonin and the machines. But I understand that all have been streamlined. I have the the officers that we spoke about, they sounded confident saying that India might not see anything close to what Pakistan has witnessed in the last few days. Locusts are ancient creatures and have found mention in religious texts like the Mahabharata, Quran and Bible. The 10th chapter in the book of Exodus in the Bible mentions locusts as the 8th plague that is believed to have taken place in the 15th century BCE. We have read about these locust attacks in our literature. For example, you know, in the Hindi literature or Bengali literature, we have had mentions of locust attacking crops and causing a lot of devastation. What the Bible talks about is the sky being darkened by the locusts and that exactly is what's happening now. Locusts know no borders. And so stopping them cannot be the task of one country alone. And that's why LWO has been reaching out to different countries for a coordinated effort. For India, 2019 had been the first time in 40 years since it had seen a locust attack. And at present, the magnitude of the attack, I think, is going to be the most severe India has reported since the last, uh, more than last 20, 25 years. It is a very unprecedented crisis and it is or it can all be traced back to those uh, cyclonic storms which had hit the Arabian Peninsula in 2018. Over the past few years, cyclones like these have become more frequent. And that is because oceans have grown warmer due to global warming. Warmer oceans increase the risk of more cyclones, which then increases the risk of rains in unfamiliar landscapes making conditions ideal for locusts to lay eggs. At this moment, India has four active swarms in Rajasthan and three in Madhya Pradesh, some of whom have come to Maharashtra also. So we have to control them as fast as we can. Otherwise, it is going to be another big disaster, maybe bigger than COVID also. Next, we talk about the Shramik special trains. Over the past few weeks, the railways has been running special trains for the lakhs of migrant workers stranded in cities due to the ongoing lockdown. For most, these trains are the only way they can get back home. The railways by now has run close to 4,000 such trains. But these trains have run into several problems. We spoke to Avishek Dasadar, who covers railway for the newspaper, about these problems and what the railways has said about it. So there's a huge unpredictability about the distribution of food on these trains and water availability of drinking water, etc. And, you know, there's a problem with running water in the toilet. The toilets are clogged and a scuffle breaking out among migrants, the passengers over, over food. Obviously, the trains are hugely delayed in many cases and the routes are diverted and there are In several cases, even the official routes notified for these trains are not the usual routes. And so all this is adding to the stress of the journey. I mean, so we are told by people who are running these trains are also some of the people who've been on board these trains. They're telling us that these are long journeys and, you know, 45, 50 degrees Celsius in some places, upwards of 40 degrees Celsius temperature. And these are non-AC coaches. And the journey on a Shramik special, it's safe to say that it's stressful. This has raised several questions about the Indian railways. One of them is that if railways is having to manage fewer trains right now, then how is it that even now trains are getting delayed? In some cases, by more than 30 hours. Railways is saying that 80% of these trains at any given time, they are converging into one or two routes which are going to Bihar and UP. Like most of the migrants, the passengers, they are going to these two states. So because there are so many trains heading to a select few places with limited platforms, the railway says that the routes are getting congested. And also that unlike other times, these trains are not running on a time schedule. 
what railways claims is that there's a lot of uncertainty over the boarding protocol that is handled by the states like for example there have been cases where let's say the departure time of a train is 4 o'clock from bombay the train couldn't depart at 4 o'clock because the entire boarding formality of protocol of you know taking down names etc distributing food and then health screening etc all that did not conclude in time for the train to depart at 4 so if the train misses that time slot then it invariably eats into the time slot of another train you know and somewhere along the route eats into the path of another train or has to you know jostle for space similar problems come during the time of deboarding as well where health protocols have to be followed another problem is that at times the states that send migrants back are eager to do so but the states that have to receive them are not on the other hand some states have accused the railways of not keeping them in the loop so that they can make arrangements for the arrival i won't say it's not an efficiency issue it is also an efficiency issue vis a vis planning but then the congestion part is not entirely wrong and because of that i mean a few days ago what railways did was that obviously many trains were being diverted so one of the things that railways did was that it started notifying the alternate routes when you notify the route then you know all the divisions along the route they are prepared that this train is coming even if it's a longer route or not the usual route then probably the availability of meals and water etc and in watering the train the water in the train needs to be replenished all these things can be probably better planned but the fact remains these journeys are quite stressful that is what what people are telling us it's not really a just like a journey in a, in the normal times i mean given the constraints and how things are being managed then there is also this uncertainty over you know the schedule of the train railways are supposed to you know publicize the schedule timing etc i am not sure that is happening as much as it should have okay that is also adding to the uncertainty for passengers on board Avishek says that around the 15th of May most of these problems were in fact flagged by the railways to different zones and divisions. It's safe to say that the system has been aware of these issues for quite a while now. I mean it's not like these issues are cropping up now and taking the system by surprise. The railways has also been accused of losing trains. This is after a number of trains took a significantly longer route to reach the intended destination. For example a UP bound shramik special from Maharashtra had taken the route but via Odisha the one thing to understand is that a train never loses its path you know an engine doesn't have a steering wheel the driver doesn't decide where the train goes right so the route of a train is decided by the control centers and there's a whole paraphernalia so a train never loses its path one of the technical things that is told to us is that you know every coach has a, you know a battery for the battery to be charged the train needs to keep moving now facing a congestion if a train is like you know standing for hours together at one place the battery will not charge in this heat the fans will not work and all these things all these technical things come into play right so there have been occasions where a train has to keep moving so that maybe it's not its route but it reaches a division where the train the water can be replenished and probably food can be arranged as an emergency measure these things have been done railways uh, has also in the meantime revised uh, the financial powers of the divisions so that every division is allowed to spend up to 1 lakh rupees to arrange for food for each train so all these things are being done and irctc which was i mean which is principally in charge of supplying meals well there have been many complaints they have been supplying food and water but uh, the fact is there have been many complaints about the availability of food and water on these trains adding to the overall stress of the journey for the passenger the thing to consider here is that these journeys are not planned trips these are journeys being taken in the time of extreme distress and during an unprecedented crisis passengers in these trains include everyone from the old young toddlers pregnant mothers and even people suffering from different kinds of ailments there are people who have been deprived of their daily wages who are scared who have been hungry for days and who are then having to travel in sweltering heat in a non ac compartment during a pandemic and on top of this several in the past have told indian express reporters that they've had to pay for these journeys in a time like this it then becomes crucial that they reach home as soon as possible and are provided basic necessities like food and water something about which many have complained and the trains for reasons discussed earlier have been delayed and on these trains a number of deaths have also taken place until yesterday at least 9 people had died this included a mother who can be seen in a clip that went viral on social media the clip showed her child trying to pull the sheet of her dead body in a bid to wake her up 
the railways has pointed that many people who have died had underlying illnesses if somebody had a heart problem returning post surgery from some place and somebody had a kidney issue and probably had gone to some some big city for some treatment and were coming back etc so railways is trying to say that these are not deaths because of any unavailability of food and water that is what railways is trying to say we will not try to hazard a guess as to how these people died i mean that's for the authorities to decide after post mortem but the fact remains these journeys are stressful journeys given all the constraints yesterday the supreme court which has taken suo moto cognizance of the migrant crisis posed several questions to the center it asked what is the estimated time required to shift migrants what arrangements are being made and what's being done to ensure that they are given information are workers asked to shell out money why should there be food shortage among people the court also issued an interim order later that no fare either by train or bus would be charged from migrant laborers and it should be shared by states it also ruled that the originating state should provide meal and water at the station while the railways need to provide the same during the journey in the end we talk about the drug hydroxychloroquine or hcq which is being experimented with as a potential treatment and as a preventive against covid-19 it is currently under trial in many research centers where its efficacy against the virus is being tested in india the indian council of medical research or icmr has been recommending it as a preventive drug to frontline workers like doctors and policemen and has been using it to treat patients suffering from covid-19 Last week the drug came in the news again after Lancet a leading British medical journal published the largest observation study to date on the effects of the drug Avantika Ghosh who reports on health for the Indian Express and who has been extensively reporting on the coronavirus now talks about what the report's findings were The Lancet study basically it concluded that I'm reading verbatim the conclusion it says we were unable to confirm a benefit of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine when used alone or with a macrolide a macrolide is is an antibiotic like azithromycin when used alone or with a macrolide on in hospital outcomes for covid-19 each of these drug regimens were associated with decreased in hospital survival which means patients who are dying faster and an increased frequency of ventricular arrhythmias when used for treatment of covid-19 Ventricular arrhythmia refers to irregular heartbeats. This has been long known to be one of HCQ's side effects. Avantika also says that there are other studies that also point to this. There is another study actually in the BMJ which actually essentially came to the same conclusion that we could not find any benefits of using it but we did find the adverse events we did find the heart rate problems. but she says that there have also been some smaller studies that have talked about its benefits against covid-19 and the jury still seems to be out on it hcq has been used traditionally against malaria and now for autoimmune diseases like lupus this is one of the reasons that supporters of hydroxychloroquine cite for use of hydroxychloroquine for covid-19 treatment and prophylaxis because your malaria it will be for short periods you'll get the disease you'll have the drug you'll get fine but when you have an autoimmune disease you have it for far longer periods for months and months and months so the fact that it's used there and it's tolerated for long durations that is actually being cited by experts supporting the drug and i suppose because covid-19 is so much of an unknown entity for everybody and there is so much pressure for want of a better word to find something that people are trying out all options at the present moment but almost 2 days after the lancet study was published the world health organization or who announced that it will no longer assign patients hcq as part of its solidarity trial and it cited the lancet study as one of the reasons solidarity is an international initiative for clinical trials launched by the who along with partners to help find an effective treatment for covid-19 In these trials there are many drugs being used there's remdesivir which has generated a lot of hope across the world then there is lopinavir ritonavir the anti hiv drugs that india used on covid patients for a very brief while and that's one arm then there is another arm where you are using this drug combination lopinavir and ritonavir 
with interferon beta 1a, which is again an immune modulator. So it's supposed to help the action of these drugs. And the fourth arm was hydroxychloroquine, which has for now been suspended. India is also a part of the solidarity trial. There are many hospitals in India where patients are being recruited for the trial. But Abantika points that those patients who have already been getting HCQ in those trials will continue to get it. So if the side effects were that worrying, even that would have stopped. But that's not stopping. And all they've said is that we will probably review it by the 15th of June and we'll come to a conclusion on whether to continue or not. That is the present status as far as the solidarity trial and WHO is concerned. Currently, the other big place that has been studying the drug is the Oxford University. It is running the recovery trial, which is the largest randomized controlled trial of HCQ for COVID-19. And they too have now come out with a statement. They have come out with a statement that we have reviewed the available evidence. And one of the points that was made in that statement is that the particular study based on which this decision was taken it is possible that it had a bias in the sense that the drug was already being given to patients who were much worse off, their disease had progressed much more. So maybe that sort of biased the results of the trial in the sense that what they're saying is that if you give a certain diabetes drug, which you know acts, and it's a trial, you will often give it to the worst patients. And then the drug probably has less chances of acting. They've made the statement and based on that, they're saying that, yeah, we are continuing recruitment and we will continue to look at hydroxychloroquine and see if there is anything in this theory that it does stop the virus from entering the cell. Meanwhile, other countries like France, Italy and Belgium have now taken steps and decided not to use the drug against COVID-19. One reason the drug has gained immense popularity around the world as we discussed in previous episodes, is because of US President Donald Trump touting it and now even claiming to take the drug himself. The frontline workers, many, many are taking it. I happen to be taking it. I happen to be taking it. Hydroxychloroquine? I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. Right now, yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I started taking it. Because I think it's good. I've heard a lot of good stories. And if it's not good, I'll tell you right, I'm not going to get hurt by it. It's been around for 40 years for malaria, for lupus, for other things. I take it. But this encouragement isn't reflected in U.S.'s official guidelines. USA has done an emergency authorization for use of the drug. So which means that depending on the physician's call, the drug can be given to certain patients. But regulatory agencies in the U.S. are by no means as sold on the drug as the president of the country seems to be. They are taking it one step at a time. The official statement says that they acknowledge the drug's side effects and other studies that show its lack of effectiveness against the virus, but that they do authorize its use in select cases. India, on the other hand, continues to use it both as a prophylaxis, that is for prevention, and for treatment. Treatment of severe patients, it's, it's being used along with azithromycin. And for frontline workers, not just healthcare workers, police constables, people who routinely come in contact in them, also it has now been recommended. Basically, non-healthcare frontline workers can have it. Anybody who, during the course of their work, have a heightened probability of coming in contact with a patient can use it. And India has very, very emphatically said that we have, as a country, we have a huge experience of using chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And we have also reviewed the data several times, including last week when we expanded it to include non-healthcare frontline workers. All of that data has been looked at. We have looked at the studies that show that how it prevents the entry of the virus along with zinc, it prevents the entry of the virus. And this is a very strong biological plausibility for its use. So we are right now very firmly going with our decision to use hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis. And for treatment, however, when we asked Dr. Balram Bhargava off the camera, he told us that we will review the data there as well. But at the present moment, yes, it's still being given to patients. That's where we stand. You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show, as always, was edited and mixed by our producer, Joshua Thomas. 
If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcasts at the rate indianexpress.com.